most amazing thing about this, this whole process is that we're actually raising dinosaurs. These guys date back over 80 million years, alligators do. So actually, in effect, what we're doing is digging dinosaur eggs. And that's, uh, to me, that's very fascinating. Frank Godwin, who's been dealing with alligators all his life, often refers to them as dinosaurs, and with good reason. The gator that glides silently past your fishing boat, the gator that always loses the wrestling match, the gator that wanders down an urban highway, has been around in essentially the same form for well over 80 million years. The American alligator is Florida's true and living link with prehistoric times. And ever since tourists started discovering Florida around the turn of the century, the alligator has been a star attraction. From one end of Florida to the other, there are attractions celebrating this incredible survivor. Just about anyone who takes an airboat ride in the Everglades or a canoe trip on a picturesque Florida river hopes to see an alligator, and they usually do. The American alligator is one of the world's more than 20 species of crocodilians, including caimans, gharials, and crocodiles. Floridians like to think of the gator as our very own ferocious reptile. And indeed, Florida does have the largest population. The alligator, though, can be found as far north as the Carolinas and west to Texas. But no other state has traded on the alligator mystique to the extent that Florida has. You see, the alligator conjures up images of a time when many looked upon Florida as one gigantic swamp with dangerous creatures lurking everywhere. The alligator was the king of that swamp, with an undeserved reputation as a man-eater who would swamp a boat with one slap of his tail and then disappear into the black water with his helpless victim. And the alligator became the real-life embodiment of those toothy killers and scores of jungle movies. How many times did Tarzan nearly become an appetizer? Of course, those were usually much more aggressive crocodiles, but hey, they all look the same, don't they? So the alligator found itself in the 20th century with a reputation, a sinister, dangerous, ugly beast with an ornery disposition and a ravenous appetite for anything that crossed its path. Of course, the Indians knew better. The Seminoles and Miccosukees and the extinct tribes that went before them lived with the alligator, celebrated the alligator, and depended upon the alligator. And when droves of visitors descended on Florida, the Indians soon took advantage of their gator fascination. That's not to say the Indians had a corner on the alligator market. Some non-Indian Florida natives and early settlers saw the alligator as representing a livelihood, either through hunting or displaying gators to the tourists. In those early days, the hunting was not only legal, it was unregulated. Hunters could kill gators until their boats were piled high with hides. It was especially a problem in the vast Everglades region of southern Florida, where in dry seasons, so many alligators gathered in small ponds that a single hunter could kill 200 or more in one day. To understand that, you have to understand the water cycles of the Everglades. With the arrival of spring rains, much of the Everglades is covered with a sheet of shallow water. The alligators spread out through lakes, canals, and rivers. With water pouring out of the glades and flowing down rivers to Florida Bay and the Gulf of Mexico, gators will swim great distances in search of food. They follow the flow, even when it mixes with salt water to become brackish. Although gators have been seen in the Gulf of Mexico on rare occasions, they rarely venture into salt water. In years with especially heavy freshwater flow, gators will venture well into the 10,000 Islands area along the southern fringe of Everglades National Park in search of food. The gators are attracted to the rookeries, filled with ibis, egrets, herons, and other species. The gators know they'll be able to feed on chicks that tumble from nests, and wading birds intent on sparing a small fish or a careless raccoon. The alligator is one predator that will eat almost anything that comes within range of its powerful jaws. Tach Brown, born in 1920 to a pioneering Chukaluski Island family, grew up hunting alligators from one end of the Everglades to the other. He was especially fond of hunting in his home territory, the 10,000 Islands. 
most fun I ever had in my life was hunting alligators. Something about alligator hunting is a little different from hunting most animals. They're, they're so stupid in some ways and they're so smart in others. And it's kind of a kick to put a little trick on them. You can find one uh, that's wild and can't kill him. So you go up there and find him on the bottom, sitting on the bottom, and give him hell with that pole, a gator hook. And then he's scared of what's in the water, so he'll go out to the land, <laughs> walk around, crawl around through the roots. The next day, we spotted a nice-sized gator in some mangrove roots in Alligator Creek, deep in the 10,000 Islands. Touch pulled up in his boat, and suddenly the gator, apparently feeling trapped, started thrashing around in the mangroves. know that he's gonna eat us up we don't leave him alone. Is that a good uh, good size for a skin? Yeah he's probably seven foot. After we moved the boats the gator swam out into the river but did not leave the area. It was early spring and the trees were still showing the effects of Hurricane Andrew. Todd said there had been more birds in the area than he had seen for many years, and he figured it was because the storm had cleaned out the dense foliage, allowing the birds access to roosting and feeding areas. Of course, more birds meant there were plenty of gators in the area. Todd said that years earlier, before the creation of Everglades National Park, Indians and local hunters and trappers regularly burned the marsh areas of the 10,000 islands to assure a steady supply of game. The hurricane opened up some areas much like the burning did, but prescribed burning ended with the formation of the park, so did hunting and commercial fishing within park boundaries. With little work available in Chukaluski, a center of life in the 10,000 islands, Tach and others continued hunting gators. Now though, they were poachers, often barely a step ahead of park rangers. North of park boundaries in the grasslands and hammocks of the Everglades, hunting remained legal for a few more years. In the winter dry season and times of drought, this was where the gator hunters gathered. Not to become legal, but because that's where the gators headed. When fresh water stops flowing from the glades and the salt water intrudes to the edge of the grasslands, alligators gather in ever-shrinking pools, all that remains of the sheet of water that once covered millions of acres. Because of the lack of water combined with crowded conditions in some lakes and ponds, gators will often walk for miles over land in search of water. They need the water to regulate their body temperature or they'll die in the blazing sun. As water levels recede, some gators actually dig small pits, nothing more than mud holes, really. But these gator holes mean survival, not only for the gator, but for birds and animals in need of water. It was in these areas that the gator hunters found a true bonanza. They ran their boats up the rivers, towing smaller craft, some called pit pans. They were little boats made from a single sheet of plywood. Once in the grasslands, the hunters would drag their pit pans over land to the lakes and ponds where gators gathered. In a single day, they could kill as many gators as they had in a week or two in the rivers where the hunting was more difficult. In a world far from the Everglades, People who could afford to buy alligator skin shoes, bags, belts, and wallets kept demand for the hides high. Even after the state banned gator hunting, poaching continued. But in the 1960s and early 70s, the alligator population was so decimated, they were no longer a typical sight. Tourists were no longer guaranteed to see a gator in the canals along the Tamiami Trail in US 27, or even during airboat rides into the glades. Law enforcement was increased and hunters were forced to find other means of supporting their families. Proving again that it can be an amazing survivor, the alligator rebounded, not in the decades it usually takes to restore the population of a threatened species, 
but in just a few years. And it's all the more remarkable considering the fact that of the 45 or so eggs laid by a female in early summer, predators such as wading birds, otters, and large fish will eat many of the hatchlings. The rebirth of the alligator population, especially in southern Florida, coincided with an unprecedented growth in the human population. Developments pushed westward from Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and West Palm Beach, and eastward from Naples and Fort Myers. Wild alligators and humans were now living in closer proximity than ever. Forced to share areas that were once Everglades, or at least Everglades fringe, clashes were inevitable. Gators took up residence in marinas and tourist attractions bordering wilderness areas where they got snacks from fishermen and tourists. They showed up in golf course lakes, neighborhood canals, wandered into yards and sometimes busy streets. Game and Fish Commission officers often couldn't keep up with the nuisance gator calls. We've been on this guy for over a week now, and a couple of weeks, and we had him hooked last week. And the gator was coming back and forth in everybody's yard and laying up in the banks and people started complaining because they had children and pets. And uh, what we ended up having to do was set a bait. And he came up and he took the bait after a week. Gator's probably between nine and 10 feet long and weighs about six to 700 pounds. He's a healthy gator, he's been eating real good. So he's better than average. He's a healthy gator, he's been living in a residential area and he's been having a lot of ducks here and a lot of, a lot of food. Well, what happens is the gator, he'll, uh, he'll stay up in the yards because he's, he's used to being here for all these years and he'll stay in your backyard and it's his territory, like you said, and uh, he'll just, you know, instead of going hunting for food, he'll find a new dog out here or a cat or something and he'll just say, hey, let's have at it. In the wild, most alligators are afraid of man. Get too close and they'll flee. But in an urbanized setting, even in the relative wild of a state park, gators behave differently, usually because humans have given them handouts. Feeding gators is a dangerous practice. As one old timer put it, a gator doesn't know where the food ends and the hand begins. It also changes behavior and keeps gators hanging around areas where they might previously have fled at the approach of a human. While alligators are not considered manhunters, a child or dog swimming in such waters is seen by an alligator as a meal, nothing more. Considering the burgeoning populations of humans and alligators, attacks on humans are rare but children have been killed and adults have been severely bitten. Fortunately for the human population, today's alligators are not nearly as large as their prehistoric forebears. A typical gator encountered by a human may be no more than seven or eight feet long. Thirteen footers, about as large as a male gator gets in the wild in Florida, are rarely encountered. However, excavations in Florida and Texas have unearthed fossilized heads of gators estimated to have been 45 to 50 feet in length. Imagine meeting an alligator the size of a semi-trailer truck. In prehistoric Florida, uh, we did have some really interesting alligators. I have found in the past several alligator skulls that would measure anywhere from three to four to five feet in length. Uh, fortunate, unfortunately, I don't have those specimens now, but I have this one, and this is a specimen of a giant crocodile, a crocodile we call Gavial Sucus americanus. We do have some gavials today in Africa, but they are not the size of this critter right here. This animal would, would measure anywhere from 30 to 32, 33 feet. Using the formula that gator poachers use from the center of the eye orbit to the center of the nasal passage of this crocodile it measures 32 inches. So therefore, at a foot an inch, it would approximately have been about 30 to 32, 33, 34, five feet long. In the late 1980s, with Florida's alligator population estimated at a million or more, the state's Game and Freshwater Fish Commission decided to allow limited hunting as a form of population control. Once again, hunters born by airboat and outboard would light up the swamps with powerful headlamps and Q-beams. Now, however, the number of hunters was rigidly controlled. As many as 5,000 might apply, but through a lottery system, only 750 people would get gator hunting permits statewide. There were size and bag limits, and the hunts took place in areas tightly supervised by commission officers. Gators are hunted at night because their eyes give them away. The hunter shines a light along a shoreline until the light is reflected in a set of eyes. The boat is then maneuvered close to the gator and a large hook baited with chicken or some other meat is tossed out. If the gator is hungry, he'll take the bait and the fight is on. 
The hunter uses a strong rod and reel with 100 or higher test line. Fighting a sizable gator is like trying to horse a huge amberjack off a wreck. And the gator doesn't always lose. The angry gator has to be brought alongside the boat to make sure it's of legal size before it can be dispatched with a bang stick, which is thrust into the water at the end of a pole. A miss could mean the gator will take off and the hunter will have another lengthy battle. Even if a gator appears to be dead, the jaws are taped before it's brought aboard a boat. Gators are tough. Occasionally, they are merely stunned. More than a few hunters have paid a painful price when an untaped gator has come to life in a boat. Once the night's hunt is over, hunters are required to check out with game officers who measure and weigh each gator, as well as recording the sex and other pertinent data for research purposes. Tag number 32, Steve Marshall. <laughs> yep. Six foot five inches. Three foot one inch. One foot seven inches. She's over eight feet. For many hunters, a head will become a mounted trophy, symbolic of a hard and dangerous night's work. Some will have the hide tanned and use it for their own purposes. Most, however, will sell the hide, possibly even the delicious meat of the tail. But such a limited hunt can't come close to satisfying demand for hide products and meat, which has become quite the delicacy in recent years. That's where alligator farms come into the picture. With the demand for hides remaining steady in the U.S. and abroad, and the increasing demand for gator meat, especially by restaurants, alligator farming is now a thriving industry. There are facilities that are farms and nothing more. And there are tourist attractions which have embraced farming as an added business venture. Uh, we raise about a thousand alligators for the market uh, every year. Mm -hmm. now what becomes of them? Well, they're used for their valuable hide, of course, to make uh, alligator accessories, pocketbooks, boots, belts, wallets. And uh, we also uh, uh, market the meat of the alligator, as you know, which is quite tasty. Uh, the meat. Uh, and just the last few years has become a very valuable commodity with um, alligator farmers. It's uh, actually the thing that's uh, in this day and age that's really supporting the farmer because the price of the hides on the open market have uh, declined in the last couple of years. While the confined gators entertain the tourists by jumping for chickens or being subdued in wrestling matches, their freer cousins at gator attractions across the country are, among other things, breeding. If you think gators spend their lives silently lurking on sunny banks or with their eyes and noses barely above water, then you haven't been around gators in springtime, mating season. Bull gators slap the water with their heads and splash with their tails to show their dominance. They engage in savage battles. And the swamp comes alive with the deep-throated rumbles as courtship begins, with females bellowing and bull gators answering. One bull will eventually mate with several females, that process taking place underwater. In southern Florida, the start of the rainy season, sometime in May, sets gators on the move. As the Everglades fill with water, the alligators spread out in search for food. Some may have nearly starved during the dry season. The females, which have made it, are also searching for suitable nest building sites. It's a bit different in this alligator farm where the gators never lack for a meal. The females just go about the task of nest building. The assembling of a mound of vegetation, leaves, grass, water plants, whatever she can find. While the bottom portion may be in water, she has to make sure that the egg chamber will not become flooded. In early July, the female will dig a hole in the top of the mound and lay her eggs. The warmth of the sunshine combined with heat generated by the rotting vegetation incubates the eggs. Incubation takes about 59 days, meaning the hatchlings will start appearing around the end of August. At least that's what happens in the wild. However, alligator farmers typically remove the eggs from the nests soon after they're laid and place them in incubators. That can be a dangerous operation because the females are usually ferocious guardians of their nests. These gals are very protective of their nest, as you can see. Now what we've got to do is 
run them off and take and pull the nest apart and pull the eggs out. It's not for the faint of heart. In order to get at the nest, the female has to be encouraged go. to move to a safe distance her. away and stay away. So while one person opens the nest and starts removing the eggs, one or two others stand guard duty. And they have to be ever alert because the female, by now highly agitated, will keep trying to find a route back to the nest. If the gator gets too close, long poles will be used to tap her on her sensitive nose. She'll usually back off for a while. As each egg is removed from the nest, it's marked with a pencil before being placed in a bucket. It's like stamping the egg this side up. Each egg must be transported and placed in the incubator in the same position it was found in the nest so as not to damage the embryo. The same process will be repeated at each nest on the property, and there could be as many as 30. The nest, incidentally, is where the sex of the alligators is determined. The eggs in the higher portion of the chamber tend to become males simply because the warming of the sun keeps temperatures as much as seven degrees higher than in the lower level. The same result may be obtained through control of the temperature in the incubator. The incubator babies, each about eight inches long, are also born in late August or early September. In the wild, the mother would open the nest and assist some of the hatchlings in getting out of the eggs, help them get to the water, and try to protect them from predators such as wading birds. Of course, here there are no predators to cut into the survival rate, and a regular supply of food means they will experience a growth rate three times greater than that of their wild cousins. After a couple of years, these gators will be large enough for harvest, the delicious tail meat headed for restaurants, the prized hides being turned into consumer products to be sold throughout the world. And because the alligator was once threatened, the farms are closely supervised by a variety of government agencies. Of course, our primary regulator, as far as the alligators are concerned, is the Florida Fish and Game Commission out of Tallahassee, of course. And uh, uh, they regulate us uh, to not so much as to, we can raise as many alligators as we want to raise. But what they're concerned about is the wild population of the alligators. Uh, there's always a potential for an alligator farmer to possibly bring in some illegal eggs and hatch them on his farm or process some illegally killed alligators through this facility. And uh, their regulations uh, are such that uh, it would be very difficult for a farmer to do this, if there were a farmer, of course, that uh, would stoop <laughs> to one of these black market activities. And we certainly hope that there's none of those in the state. But I agree, uh, you know, you talk about regulations. We're regulated probably by uh, not only the Game Commission, but the USDA, the FDA, the uh, uh, EPA, <laughs> and a lot of those other initials. But, you know, regulations are, are good. Uh, most of the regulations are good for the industry. And the industry, the legitimate industry, has a lot of say as to what those regulations are. And over the years, we've been able to work very closely with the Game Commission and the other uh, regulatory agencies. And I feel right now that there is a fine uh, working relationship between the regulatory agencies and alligator farming. Uh, ten years ago, that was a different story. While considerable alligator research has been carried out in the Florida swamps, a great deal of what has been learned about alligator behavior is the result of studies carried out at alligator farms and attractions. And if you want to see really huge gators, you'll find them at the attractions. These guys got so big because they don't have to cover vast areas in search of meals. They don't have to walk for miles in search of water in times of drought. The American alligator, an original Florida native, still flourishing in spite of what man and the forces of nature have done to the landscape over millions of years. With thousands of new residents moving to Florida every year, more and more habitat is being lost and freshwater supplies are dwindling. That means survival of a large alligator population is not assured. However, as long as our wild rivers and lakes, the Everglades and other critical wetlands can be protected and assured of a constant flow of water, there will be alligators in Florida. And future generations will continue to thrill at the sight of our very own dinosaur, silently patrolling his watery domain.
This program was produced and licensed by International Video Projects Incorporated of Lakeland, Florida. For additional information about this program and other programs we offer, please write International Video Projects, 6700 South Florida Avenue, Suite 28, Lakeland, Florida, 33813-3312, or call toll-free, 800-852-0662. Our collection of programs may also be reviewed on our website, www.videoprojects.tv. Thanks for watching.